Hydrocephalus is a disorder where there is an excessive amount of the cerebrospinal fluid that accumulates inside the cerebral ventricles as well as the subarachnoid space. So the word hydrocephalus means water, so hydro means water, and then cephalus means brain. So water in the brain. And this condition arises as a consequence of imbalance in the production and outflow of the cerebrospinal fluid. Now there are different forms of the hydrocephalus that are listed here. And then there are also other conditions like Dandy Walker and Arnold Kyrie syndrome, which are associated with dilated or compression of the fourth ventricles. So what I'm going to do is that first I would like to describe the normal physiology of the cerebrospinal fluid production and then discuss the anatomy of the cerebral ventricles after which it would become very easy to understand the mechanism of pathogenesis of these disorders. So cerebrospinal fluid, it's being produced by the choroid plexus and in order to be more specific, it's the ependymal cells of the choroid plexus that produces the cerebrospinal fluid. And these cells are dependent on an active transport system that uses the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. And so therefore, if a patient has elevated intracranial pressure and we want to decrease the production of cerebrospinal fluid, we can provide these patients with the acetazolamide which is a form of diuretic that inhibits the carbonic anhydrase enzyme. As a consequence of which, now that carbonic anhydrase is inhibited, ependymal cells can no longer produce cerebrospinal fluid. As a consequence of which, the intracranial pressure will start to drop. So once again, the cerebrospinal fluid is being produced by the ependymal cells of the choroid plexus, and these cells are dependent on the function of the carbonic anhydrase enzyme. And so if you provide patients with acetazolamide, since the carbonic anhydrase enzyme would be inhibited, the production of cerebrospinal fluid will be decreased, as a consequence of which now there would be decreased intracranial pressure. Now as for the circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid, most of the cerebrospinal fluid is being produced inside the lateral ventricles as well as the third ventricle. So the startup of the CSF would be inside the lateral ventricles. So we have one here and then one we have at the back there. And then via the foramen of Monroe, which is right here, cerebrospinal fluid would be able to be transported from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle. So this is the foramen of Monroe. Here we had the lateral ventricles and then this one is the third ventricle. And then from here on cerebrospinal fluid will flow from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct of the sylvius. So this one is the cerebral aqueduct of the sylvius that will connect the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. And then from here on, the cerebrospinal fluid will flow into the subarachnoid space via the foramen of Lushka as well as foramen of Magendi. And if you ever confuse which one is which, the way you can memorize it is that foramen of Magendi is in the midline. So foramen of Magendi is in the midline, while the foramen of Lushka's, where there is two of them, are lateral. So Lushka is lateral, while foramen of Magendi, where there is only one of it, is in the midline. All right, now to review all these findings one more time. So the cerebrospinal fluid are being produced in the ependymal cells of the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle. From here on, they will be transported into the third ventricle via the foramen of Monroe. And then they will be transported from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct of the sylvius. So here we had foramen of Monroe, and now here we have the cerebral aqueduct of the sylvius. So cerebral aqueduct of sylvius. And then from the fourth ventricle via the foramen of Lushka 
and for Amen of Mejendi, they would be transported into the arachnoid space. And then from the subarachnoid space, they would be transported into the superior sagittal sinus via the arachnoid villi. And so with that information in mind, now we can go ahead and review different forms of hydrocephalus. So the first two forms of hydrocephalus, non-communicating and communicating hydrocephalus, these are more common in children and are associated with elevated intracranial pressure. On the other hand, the other two hydrocephalus that I will discuss next are more common in adults and then these two forms of hydrocephalus, the hydrocephalus ex vacuo and normal pressure hydrocephalus have a normal intracranial pressure. In any case, back to the forms of hydrocephalus that are more common in children. So these forms of hydrocephalus are associated with elevated intracranial pressure. The first form is a non-communicating hydrocephalus, also known as obstructive hydrocephalus. And the reason this name is given to it is that the ventricles of the brain cannot communicate with each other. So some sort of obstruction prevents the communication between the brain ventricles. And the most common site that is being affected is the cerebral aqueduct of the sylvia and the reason for that is that this cerebral aqueduct has a narrow structure so you know how this cerebral aqueduct has a narrow structure and so thus it's at increased risk of being obstructed and cause non-communicating hydrocephalus where the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle can no longer communicate with each other and so now you can imagine that if the fourth ventricle is being obstructed the findings that you see is dilation of the third ventricle as well as the dilation of their lateral ventricles so let's go back here to non-communicating hydrocephalus. So usually it's the cerebral aqueduct of the sylvius that is being obstructed as a consequence of which it will cause increased size of the lateral as well as the third ventricles. And then the condition that usually causes obstruction of the cerebral aqueduct of the sylvius is the tumor of the ependymal cells which is also known as append Demoma. And so this type of tumor can arise in the fourth ventricle as a consequence of which it will block the fourth ventricle and cause non-communicating hydrocephalus. The next condition is communicating hydrocephalus. So this form of hydrocephalus, there is a normal communication between the cerebral ventricles. But now the problem is the impaired absorption of the cerebrospinal fluid from the arachnoid villi. And it's usually conditions that cause inflammation of the arachnoid villi, like for instance meningitis, that are the underlying cause of the communicating hydrocephalus. Now you can imagine that if none of the cerebrospinal fluid is being absorbed, therefore it's all of the ventricles that are being affected. So here we will have dilation of the fourth ventricle, dilation of the third ventricle, as well as dilation of the lateral ventricle. So once again, since the cerebrospinal fluid is not being absorbed in the arachnoid villi, now we will have dilation of the third, fourth, as well as lateral ventricles compared to the non-communicating hydrocephalus where it was due to the obstruction of the cerebral